What is wellness? I think of the image of wellness as like pure joy. The important thing is for people to choose, like, what do you want to do? Wellness are the things your grandmother told you to do. When you really start to think about it, the answer feels more complicated. I'm Maya Feller, registered dietitian, nutritionist, and author. And I'm Dr. Kavita Patel. We're the hosts of Well Now, Slate's new podcast on wellness. Join us every Wednesday as we tackle that simple yet important question, what does it mean to be well? All right. Hello, everyone. Guess what? Producer Steph and I are here. Hello. Say hi, Steph. Hello, hello. Like I put you in a, in a like a, a backyard. Like, say hi, Steph. Like, that was that horrible mother. <laughs> it's like, smile for the photo. Smile for the photo. <laughs> say please. Say thank you. Anyway, we have some very exciting bonus content for you all. Um, we recently connected with the founders of the Mashup Americans, Amy S. Choi and Rebecca Lair. And we had this phone call. We were just, you know, trying to say hello and talk about our projects. And we ended up in this like 30 minute discussion about hope and grief. And Steph and I were like, oh my God, we, we have to just chat about all this stuff. And then the next, you know, somebody yelled out bonus content. It was probably me. And, and here we are. <laughs> Definitely. So we wanted to say welcome you too. Welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank- hello. Sometimes we say thank you at the same time, like weird little twins. <laughs> Cute. That's what happens when you run a business together. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself, each of you. I'm Amy. Um, the way I mash up is I am a first generation Korean American. I'm the first person in my family to be born in the United States. Um, I am married to a first generation Colombian Mexican American. And I have two Korean Colombian Mexican kids here in Brooklyn, but it is fundamental to me that I grew up in the Midwest and I have some very Midwestern tendencies. But um, (laughs) yeah, Rebecca and I found each other at a point where we were like, what are all of these hyphens? And they are so important to us. Um, And so, you know, Mashup was born. Yeah. Um, You can't see because this is a, that's the medium we're in, but I'm sitting in my children's room it's a lot happening. It's a visual <laughs> mess. My name is Rebecca Lair, and I am a Salvadoran Jewish Angelino. And Amy and I started the Mashup Americans nearly 10 years, well, in 2013. So and we're coming on our 10th anniversary to sort of explore all the hyphens of our identities. Woo. I know it's very, you are entrepreneurs. You understand it's a big deal to like, that's a huge deal. Have a business that still exists. Especially one that you invented. So that feels cool. And um, really, it's about, you know, both of us are first generation, even though our family's immigrant stories are really different. Actually, there's so much interconnected about um, the questions that we have about ourselves, about about what it means to belong, about the amount of guilt we have. And, and Amy and I met through my husband. They were high school best friends. Aww. And so we met years ago when we were asking a lot of questions about what it meant to like marry somebody different from ourselves and raise children and like what do you call them? <laughs> like what <laughs> names do we give kids when and what traditions do you think about and what foods are you introducing? And and so that's the genesis of it and now 10 years later we've have this studio where we're telling stories both our own and other folks about just led with this sort of deep curiosity. That's fantastic. So we have obviously well adjusting that the whole point is to have some like a, a fun energy while you talk about self help sort of stuff. And, you know, like we like to say, we're not your NPR, but like there's real crossover in the grief project. And like what made you start mm-hmm. a project just entirely focused on grief? Um, I think it's probably similar to the roots of yours, and I'd love to hear that. But I think for us, it was realizing acutely in sort of the spring of 2020 as COVID was ravaging, you know, Amy is based in New York and I'm based in LA. So just those first few months, particularly in New York, being like, how are we not talking about the amount of literal death there is? We passed, I remember the 100,000 human beings in America dead and there was barely any, you know, there was no... um mourning. There was no public understanding of it or acknowledgement really of it. It was also 
the government that was in place. And it almost felt like a manifestation, like an actual illness that felt to us almost like what the last four years before that had felt like in our bodies and mm-hmm. minds as well. If you, I, I don't know how to express that in a different way, but we had experienced so much loss. We were all so on edge, so depleted, and it felt so inhumane and so targeted. And then to additionally add this layer of real sickness and dying and grief, and it felt like an awareness that particularly as Americans, it's something that we are not addressing. We're not equipped to talk about. We're not equipped to like, there's no rituals. We love to move forward Mm -hmm. and never actually deal with the shit that has happened or acknowledge, you know, try to learn from it. And, and not, not to be like grief has to be productive. That's not the answer. It's more that by metabolizing grief, by processing it, you you learn to live with it rather than pretend it didn't happen and then have it metastasize. Right. And, you know, the 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 Black Lives Matter protests of 2020 and the revelations even for all of us, you know, that the world we many of us that we had kind of thought was there is actually not really the world that is there. And there's a loss there too. So I think it was really the 2020 uh, clarified for us that grief and loss at its many layers, both death loss and grief from death, but also community grief Mm. and cultural grief and ancestral grief, that all of these are things that we have personally experienced. We watch our community experience and we just felt like and feel like having the conversation about it instead of being afraid of it and pushing it away gives us an opportunity to build the future we want Mm. rather than being mired in like pretending something away Mm -hmm. and then actually being stuck stuck and i think that's that's a sort of big picture and then Again, the show and the the season of it's, you know, an extension of all of the Mashup Americans work. It's not prescriptive. We're really not trying to tell anybody how to grieve. It's more just understanding. And sometimes, and Amy can speak more to this because I think she articulates it so beautifully, but there was something about talking to experts about like, this isn't a show where we're talking about people's personal grief stories yeah. because there's beautiful shows like that that exist that we love and we listen to and our friends make but it was about like let's talk to some experts like what happens in your body yeah. when you grieve to remind ourselves that like we didn't make it up in this world yeah. of like untruth or alternate truth facts what was the fucking thing it was that, alternate, that, facts. Conway, alternate facts you know alternate facts <laughs> in this world where like Science has no meaning, apparently. Yeah. Like, we're like, actually, these are studyable things because being human is loving and being human is grieving and being human is dying. So we can l- learn from yeah. them. I don't know, Amy, anything you want to? Well, I think, you know, there is so much of like Rebecca and Mai's work, and which is always driven by our own curiosity and like our personal obsessions mm-hmm. that when it came to grief and we had very different personal histories with grief, um, which you learn a little bit about in the show, but just that the things that we were experiencing and observing in ourselves and our communities and our families, we felt like we knew them. Right. And like, we could see it in other people and we could see the patterns and, and like, there's some things that, you know, you just like know in your soul, Mm -hmm. But what we were able to do with Grief Collected was pursue those questions with experts and just get them validated to Mm -hmm. understand that there are scientists and neurophysicists and professors at the most revered institutions in America that have like longitudinal studies on grief that can tell us that like, yes, this is the hardest thing that you will experience. And yeah. know that it's not just you feeling like this is the hardest thing you have ever experienced, that this is validating, that like when you have insomnia or you're throwing up all the time after like a friend has died, that's not you losing your mind. 
That's not you like as an individual failing to like get Mm -hmm. through it or to get by or to like get over it. It is actually your body communicating with itself. It's like your limbic system saying you are in distress Mm -hmm. and that these are things that happen to all humans and also all animals that these are like essential parts of living. And it took for us like a lot of the, um, often what can feel like a little bit, and we're pretty like woo woo girls, you know, like we can get into it. Like Rebecca has like a titanium crystal vaccinated, vaccinated woo woos. Just we're so like real really shot clear, it up like what are the most, uh, how many more? <laughs> you can just say you live in LA. Kids? I feel like that's like <laughs> implied. But I just, I, I just want to make sure everyone understands. It means like hyper boosted science like, woo woos. Science woo woos. Uh-huh. And also, you know, like, I, I, like I'm first generation Korean American. I grew up with a lot of Chinese medicine. Like my mom was doing acupuncture when she sprained her wrist like in the 80s like which a lot of people here still think of as very woo woo but yeah when people speak about like the body mind connection or the emotional state or like the real emotional or kind of like spiritual journeys that grief this like monumental feelings can uh foist onto you or like force you into it can feel very woo woo and then then you're like well but what is it really or like again it becomes this like individual thing that you have to like solve for yeah Yeah. like i have to get over this or i have to fix my insomnia or like i just need to be less sad and like get more sunshine or vitamin d or whatever and it actually turns out no like your body needs to do these things and speaking to experts kind of on all levels um And we did speak to spiritual experts and we did speak to artists and we also spoke to scientists and scholars. And it's it was so just validating in every way to learn that this human experience that seems so kind of impossible is actually possible and researched and studied. And it just it felt very empowering. I I think also like just to build off that. Like, I mean, I'm Canadian, but I'm going to lump Canadians in with Americans and just pretend I'm American for this conversation. I think that's <laughs> like, right in this conversation. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. There's just like no understanding of like your body and your, um, like, there's no tie between emotions, mm-hmm. body, and like sickness. Whereas yep. I think like most other cultures and places in the world have that like relationship in some way, whether it's spiritual or through like traditional medicine. And, and I think understanding that like body part of it at least for me was mind-blowing because I was like it was that affirmingness of it like I was like oh I'm not like losing my mind Mm -hmm. I am like physically experiencing things because I'm emotionally experiencing things and those things are linked together and Mm -hmm. like those symptoms that are physical are gonna you know calm down if I learn how to like harness my emotions and you know deal with them healthily instead of just being like oh it's fine (laughs) Well, and like, in addition to like what Steph's saying, like you were all talking about that like cultural thing that's handed down like patterns. And I do think that we have this real, Mm -hmm. as a country, this real like pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Like you should be fine. You should be fixed. You should be back at work. And it's like that keeps you stuck. And and then Mm -hmm. the body stuff comes up. Like it is all connected if you don't. And Amy, you were talking about like the woo-woo factor. And it's like, that we have like a cultural shame attached to exploring your feelings and processing stuff. Like who are you to take the time to, you know, you should just fix it and move on. Be grateful you have food or money or whatever. Well, I mean, that's, that's a huge chunk of it. And even just thinking about, I mean, we have a lot of jokes in here in it, but like, you know, just American ways of being. And one of the things that I just, we were talking to, um, Adrienne Marie Brown, who's one of our like heroines. So it's just a joy to use these opportunities to get to talk to people you're excited to talk mm-hmm. to. Um, it's one of our big um, cons that we're pulling uh, <laughs> in life. But, you know, we were talking about just the sense of an American, um, the US, and I'd love to hear if there's a Canadian parallel here, <laughs> but there's the narrative we tell. Storytelling is um, is hugely important. And it's hugely important, actually, to grieving. It's something we learned from the psychologists, like being together and telling stories. They have an impact on your body and on your grieving process. But the other piece of that is that the American mythologizing, American myth-making, 
about what it means to be America. We've been this way. We are this way. This is what it is. And no willingness to adjust to that or to realize that it's Love like, it or leave it. In the grand scheme of <laughs> culture and history, it's like two it's like two minutes old. Mm-hmm. You know, and that and we were joking about how like you go anywhere else in the world and they'll be like, This random bar is five hundred yeah. years old. Or like <laughs> you're just like in a countryside in France, which isn't even the oldest place with the oldest shit, and everything is way older than anything in post indigenous, post destruction of native culture. <laughs> America. And yeah. there's this funny game that people do where they you read the news of America, the American news of other places and then read about if you read about America the way that we talk about other places and you're like like the nonsense that's happening in the speaker of the house. All this stuff that's <laughs> happening and if you were anywhere else we would talk about it with a totally different set of languages. So that's the piece about Americanness which is We're also very much American. You know, we might be hyphenated or first generation, but we are of this place. I mean, we are and we're swimming in it. And so it's this mix of stuff for us that that I think is part of what the mashup alchemy is, which is that we're like we're in it. We're of it. We're also able to ask some questions because we have a little bit of information or something in us that is like, this doesn't maybe have to be this way. And I think one of those things that, to your point, to both of you, is that this idea and the pandemic, you couldn't be with people. Right. You couldn't be in real life. You, you're you terrified of your body. You're terrified of getting sick. You're terrified of making other people sick. And yet, you want to be human with other people together. And grieving requires community. Grieving the loss of a future you thought or grieving a person requires being with the people who loved that person, the people of that community. And it's been fucking weird and hard Mm -hmm. to be so I I mean, Steph, I don't know if you are still in Canada or you but to get to Brooklyn. (laughs) Okay, so you're in Brooklyn, but your family might be in Canada, like to even our families are all over the world, like to not get to be with them, the level of isolation and pulling apart has been an, a level of loss yeah. as well. Yeah, there was like a grieving that needed to happen coming out of, well, if, if we have yeah. in fact come out of COVID, like who the hell knows if we're in no, it or out no. of it. But there's been like a grieving that happened with that as well. I mm. felt so trapped. Like I was like, I can't, I, and there was a loss of my independence and friends and all of that. And I mean, there were some things that were good that I shed, like I'm an overcommitter. Mm-hmm. And so I was able to like see less people. And that was actually very good for me. But the rest of it, we aren't acknowledging what we went through as as a, 100%. As a global. A hundred percent. I really just I love that use of shed versus loss. I haven't heard that. And I like that distinction there. Like mm-hmm. the things you shed that because it's not silver lining, which isn't our vibe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like, you know, you, you shed things that weren't serving you, but then that doesn't mean there wasn't also a lot of big losses. Yeah. And I also think that that like not acknowledging those losses is also that's so much part of like our American grief denial mm-hmm. and the mm. need, like the real, real impulse, like almost desperate impulse to get back to the way things were, which I completely understand. And also what we saw was that the way things were, were so fragile and not good in so many ways. But confronting that requires confronting our grief over both the way that things were and also how poorly managed the pandemic was by like all of our institutions. But we need to do that in order to like make the next better thing. But our Mm -hmm. imaginations are currently stuck at getting back to the way things were because we- refuse to acknowledge all of that and like yeah. just mm. it just like can't face it and i think that that's the part that you know a lot of people kind of in the past couple months have asked rebecca and i like you guys are both so like why grief you know like <laughs> like we're, like this is this is our, generally our vibe like we're we're like hanging out we're like talking about happy and it's because like i think for us like grappling with it and and trying to access what so many people said all of these experts was like a healthy expression of grief and then because we are both american type a nerds we were like but what is that (laughs) and like can you tell us and what are the steps um but being able to live with our grief and 
understand it and like get our arms around it was really a way of like getting free of it in some way or or not maybe not getting free of the grief but getting free of like whatever that stuckness was that grief gives you adrian marie brown says if you don't have the opportunity to metabolize your grief then the grief becomes your shape and i think we all know people for whom that has been true i see that in like family members i think one of the undercurrents of um motivation slash fear maybe that rebecca and i have is that like this is the shape that like our culture will take like yeah. the grief is mm-hmm. now shaped like our whole our whole everything i'm making motions guys with my arms yeah. big circular ones <laughs> she is now oh, wow. she's <laughs> now making free mo- well and i worry too that we we reverted to our base level we, we got like mm-hmm. very Lord of the Flies and just started fighting. And we were already sort of set up for that coming into mm-hmm. it. I think, you know, politically as a country and as, you know, we're the, we're very separated right now. But I think that just made it worse and everything became, I'm on this side, you're on that side. You wear this mask that puts you over there. I'm doing this that puts me over here. And it, it like... It was the opposite of what I thought we all should have been doing, which is talking more, coming together, you know, looking for collective hope. Yeah. We did none of that. We were all like, get away from me. I'm cleaning my groceries. You know, like we just did not as yeah. a culture, like I just don't feel like we handled it very well. When like having that lack of community, lack of conversation, just taking that parallel and being like, like what happened with like toilet paper, <laughs> yes. you know, uh-huh. at the beginning of the pandemic, it's like. So, like, everyone for themselves, Mm -hmm. and, like, I can't think of a more, like, dark, you know, caricature of, like, what that looks like than that moment in history where people were just like, I need this toilet paper for me, like. And to be (laughs) fair, people were, like, looking out for themselves because we had no trust that anybody else was going to look out for us. And in a lot of ways, like, we were right. Yeah. Uh, And that's, like, the definitely fucking bummer. (laughs) That's a whole other level of grief where it's like, oh, how do I, you know, how do I accept that I can't change entire systems, but also accept living within the system Mm -hmm. when you're like forced up against like so many clear examples time after time after time after time that like it's not working for you or serving you at all. I mean, that's a big (laughs) part of what we talk about in our show. It's just like. Again, grieving either a future you thought or a system you thought that even if it doesn't really serve you, it's the one you know. Mm-hmm. And and I think, you know, that can feel heady, but it's 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 actually in, in everything, right? It, exactly that. Like, well, no one's delivering packages with, you know, uh, toilet paper and minimum necessities to everyone's home during the pandemic, Mm -hmm. right? That was not happening. And so we had to do that. Luckily, part of my ancestral grief is that I anticipate the worst things all the time. (laughs) So I was like, I was a month ahead. I mean, you can't imagine that I would just casually buy like, you know what, I'm hearing this thing, I'm gonna get like 10 more cans and like, some Lysol wipes or whatever. I I had people straight up grocery shopping in my apartment because I was out (laughs) of like city and then they closed the borders between the provinces. So I couldn't Uh get back to my house. And I had like people living in my apartment and like going there, like, buying not buying they just took it obviously but like would go and get like flour and like chickpeas and stuff because like i live like an eat like i live like my nana who was like yeah wartime italian Mm -hmm. Uh, my wife is a catastrophe type person and so she was going on and on and on about how we needed all these dry goods and i am always that person who's like everything is going to be fine this is blowing over you're not losing your job meanwhile cut she worked in broadway advertising like her job was gone in four (laughs) seconds like i was like i was like oh Oh, so my god and i was like all right so i I was wrong and i'm (laughs) Super glad we have all the lentils now. (laughs) Thank you for the canvas. Um, but you know, it's funny because like when you were talking about the 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 grief thing, I we talked about this, I think once or twice on while adjusting, but my my old therapist who was one of our experts, Patricia, said that when someone dies, you you experience their death, but then you also experience the death of the idea of who who you thought they could be. So like mm. in my case, like mm-hmm. I had like a parent who was not so amazing. And so when she died, I had to process one, her death. But then I also had to process the idea of who mm. I hoped she could, maybe someday she would get to. And mm. and I think sometimes that loss, that idea, and it's and taking it to like what we're talking about, that idea of like like what you were saying, Amy, about 
the old way we lived is not it, everything's different now. We have a new normal, but we have to we have to grieve both those things in order to step into the new normal. But and I think that's where the stuck thing comes in too. If you don't do that, if you pretend it's not happening, how can you move forward? Mm-hmm. Yes, and there's so many different types of loss that that that's such a great example of it. And I would say we t- I talked a little bit about fertility stuff and mm-hmm. having miscarriages. Yep. That I never was I was never like this is a ba- baby. Everyone has their own thing, but I was like this is some cells that are making me nauseous or whatever. Yeah. My boobs sore. But when those miscarriages happened, mm-hmm. it was the loss of a future I thought was happening. Yeah. It was the loss of a a life me- becoming a parent in, in, in that way at that time. And that was a real grieving that I had to do. And no one talks about miscarriages. Yeah, right. I was and, and, say. And you're really grieving. It's mm-hmm. grieving. And again, I wasn't grieving a baby. Like that's t- sometimes it's like, like it. you can't see my posture, but it makes me stressed out to think about <laughs> it that way. It's not my experience of it. It's not how I felt it. I was grieving the life I thought was starting in January of the next year. It was like this thing and not knowing and the unknowingness of not knowing how I would become a parent when that was something really important to me. Yeah, Dorothy Hollinger, who we have on the pod, who wrote The Anatomy of Grief, which we highly recommend uh, as a book about grief in the body and a lot of this science stuff. And Amy can tell you about grief and animals. It's wild. Wild. But uh, there's all these different types of losses, like, you know, anticipatory loss. Let's say if you have somebody who's sick in your family for a long time or Alzheimer's, dementia, those kinds of losses where you're, you're already grieving while the person is still there. Um, there's these other ones, complicated grief, mm-hmm. um, you know, this grief when you're like this, what you said it nicely, I think <laughs> your mother was not such a good parent or whatever it was, it was even more, uh, not the best. Uh, I, I have friends who've lost parents that they were estranged from and that they heard like three hand removed that this parent died, but it's still, they're still grieving that loss. Yeah. And that there was never a relationship that was mended, even though this person was a piece of shit who they never wanted to mend a relationship with. But they still have to, you know. Now that possibility is gone. That possibility is gone. And that's that's hard. Exactly. I think Linda Tai talks about it as well. Um, She is a somatic therapist that really walked us through ancestral grief and family grief. And, you know, she really speaks to um, everything that you're saying, Robin, is that you know, something that really stuck with me and that um, has been a big challenge for me in my life is she was like, you know, particularly in the context of mashups and uh, families who have migrated, but this is pertinent to to anybody whose parents weren't like the awesomest, was just that like, you also grieve what you deserved Mm. and that you never got to have. And as you even learn Mm -hmm. more about that and like, maybe like as you have your own children what you give to them and that you maybe start to realize you never got and she says this thing that just like blew us out of the water which is that you deserve to be delighted in and if you weren't that that's actually worthy of grieving and that those layers get revealed over time and to me I think a, a big part of the work both in this particular project and also just in life is to be like okay Grieving that is hard and it's fucking sad and it's also good because now I know and like now you know that you are worthy of more of that and that that's something that you can like pursue in your life. For me, I feel like the more that we open our eyes or like can acknowledge or or like experience the most wonderful things is when you're like, okay, well, this this was always a possibility, this like amazing thing here. So like it sucks that I n- didn't have that or that I had the opposite of that. But then you can grieve that. Feeling like that is available feels really transformative. And it feels yeah. like, you know, I think people right now, it's like a very, I don't know, TikTok psychology thing to be like, I'm healing my inner child. But I'm like, also, I'm healing my fucking inner child, you know? And like, I think that's great. And everybody should. But maybe not from TikTok. Maybe not. Maybe not from, from TikTok. TikTok. No. Well, that's when Amy became a QAnon um, <laughs> wellness influencer <laughs> on TikTok. Oh. There's probably big yeah, money. I'm next for it. business plan. I'm super proud for it. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. 
<laughs> do you think do you think in general like in the process of doing the podcast I know that you were talking to like experts um not necessarily like talking to individuals but like you you guys are in the mix with the people are you feeling like people are more hopeful today or less hopeful like what what are your feelings Oh wow well I'm going to flip it on you cuz I need to know what if you are I I think my observation in the people around me is that people are clearer. Mm. People are in their own individual lives are focusing on gratitude a lot more, yeah. I think, generally. Um, and also, like, what am I going to do in my own life, in my own community to have impact? And the some of the bigger stuff, which is, I think that that's how you make change. But some of the like, watching this stuff in Hollywood. I live in LA. I'm like in Hollywood. No, in Washington, D.C. It just feels like far away. Yeah. And um, and in a way that didn't feel that way, I think. I haven't thought more about it th- until this moment. So it's a good question. But that that's something I, I'm observing. I think people are just like, my God, we just got to be together on New Year's. Yes. Like it feels there's something that there's a little bit of how amazing is this? And maybe it's emerging or some, I don't know. I, I think we probably have fairly self-aware. I, I mean, you know, I only talk to people who go to therapy. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that there's some awareness of the level of loss mm. that's happened. Everyone has different abilities to deal or confront grief or complicated shit. But I think there's some kind of just sitting in that and again, that gratitude. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Amy, what do you think? Yeah, I would I, I would agree. I think that people I know feel very hopeful on a very micro level. Yeah. I think a mm. past me, like a younger me, would have thought that that was kind of selfish or kind of depressing mm. to think about. But um I have very much changed my point of view on that. And I, I really do believe in this idea that like if if the tiny little parts like the atoms aren't healthy and thriving, then like in what possible universe can the whole be thriving? Mm. And like we're all, mm-hmm. so if we all just focus a little bit on like being happier and healthier and more honest with like, and also in relationship to each other, that can only possibly help mend the whole. Yeah. So I feel yeah. hopeful about that. I don't I don't know that people are like looking around at the world and feeling more hopeful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. There's a war, inflation, <laughs> yeah. global pandemic. Everything yeah. is fabulous. Recession. Yeah. <laughs> Recession. Exactly. Yeah. I th- I think like for a lot of people in the pandemic was sort of the first time. I mean, like, I talked to my siblings about this, right? I was, like, always sick as a kid, and I have OCD, so I'm, like, very familiar washing my groceries. <laughs> like, I'm, like, I I was, like, very prepared for the pandemic mm-hmm. in a sick way um, that I don't recommend You know what? For Your anyone. sickness served you. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. Stop>. Exactly. <laughs> um, but I think for a lot of people, like, it was one of the first experiences where you're forced to care about people like community, mm-hmm. you know, people mm. that walk through life, you know, not afraid that they're going to die. Um, what must that for be the like? first time? It was like, <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. But like for the first time, they were like, oh, I could seriously die. Yeah. You know what? So first of all, ugh, sorry, I won't cry. Something that also breaks my heart about those things. I'm trying in the United States, at least or at least how it feels in media, and this might be another conversation is but about part of this conversation is like how isolating it feels to only be engaging with people through like mm-hmm. the lens of like a news story or social media versions of it. And so it feels like everyone's just a fucking asshole. But how momentary that felt, at least in the US, and suddenly people are like, oh, yeah, but now I don't care because you're you're infringing on my rights yeah. as an able-bodied cisgendered white man yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> and i think i'm like that was, Fuck that was your the rights. disappointing part of Get- people <laughs> yeah yeah and that's the part which i'm trying not to as a human I-, I don't generally get caught in those but i think it's 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 one of my great heartbreaks and losses yeah. of this time is that i really love people and i really believe in people um and i know there's a lot of assholes yeah. but i do believe that like 
generally people want to have a good life and want people around them to have a good life. And maybe they they don't know that there are people who are different from them, but that are also deserve good lives. They just get caught in an idea of something. But once they know them, I do believe those barriers would come down. Mm-hmm. Like I have a strong belief in that. Mm-hmm. But like, I don't know. There's just something sometimes that's part of my heart. Something that I'm still um, grieving, well, I think. You know, what's so interesting about what both of you two are saying, and it's around what Steph's saying about the small small movements or around the clarity. You know, it's like if I start catastrophizing and I start talking about like us versus them and our democracy is broken. And if I start going into all those places and I can't believe people that I thought I knew are doing these types of things, like as soon as you, I start going there, well, then I have no hope at all. But if I come into the small mm-hmm. things, and and it just made me think, I'm just fresh off of like a, a New Year's Eve weekend with my three best friends from college. So they're, they're my sisters, mm. they're mm. my people. And we did this thing where we got together and we had, we called it the bowl of activities. And everyone had to show up with 10 activities. And they could be a question. It could be, you take a walk. It could be, you do a jello shot. It could be anything you wanted to put into it. And Jello shot. Yeah. These are your college these friends. These are my college yeah, friends. I see, I see what's um, happening here. But, mm-hmm. but everybody put in more than 10. And, and what we did is the whole weekend, whenever the momentum of one thing died, somebody goes, all right, whose turn is it? You reached in, you grabbed it. Everybody had one veto. But other than that, you had to do what was in the bowl. And the most incredible things showed up, like people putting questions, like the, you know, the second day we started off with a Bloody Mary and the question was, look at everyone in the room and tell them something about them that you admire or you love. Mm. And then it moved Mm. into like a meditation. And then the next one was go play Foursquare. And then we were playing this very (laughs) committed Foursquare game. Like we were all like, do we put bras on for this? I think we do. Let's go (laughs) in the rain. And it ended up being such a beautiful weekend where we were all just open and connected. Mm. And and one of the questions was, um, finish the sentence. Um, I declare the year of 2023 to be dot, dot, dot. And everyone sat and we sat for like an hour and a half talking about what we wanted to live into this year. And, mm. you know, and all of those things from the jello shots that happened to these deep questions were small things that brought us together. And I just, mm. it, it's hokey to say, but like, I believe that that's where the change is going to occur is in these small things and in these mm. human connections and in deep conversations. Mm-hmm. I agree. Me too. I don't know. Did we just did we just fix the world? I don't did we? Yes. I think we might have. Well, I I mean, I think for us in 2023, that's very much along the lines of what we've been thinking about what we want as a team, me and Amy, is like, how do we, you know, if I'm in New York in March, what are we all doing together? Like, are we going to have a dinner mm-hmm. that we come and then we invite a few other people and we ask one question? And that is a way of connecting for an hour with a group of people. I believe that that's it. Um, one of the things that this Dr. George Bonanno, who is the person we asked, what what the fuck is grief to? less colorfully we're like can you i'm like what is it but he runs the center for grief loss and trauma at columbia and you know one of the things we talked about was technology like always feeling like it's the worst possible time like everything Mm. we're experiencing and he was saying he thought technology and the way we get information and the way even news is the way algorithms kind of put value on one way of doing things, right? So like it's inflaming, right? That inflammation gets you more engaged. And that's the way the monetization has been structured thus far. And so but one of the things he said, and he's like, I'm hopeful of, which I appreciate, he was like, we are not equipped as humans in our brains to get information in the way that we are now. And so therefore, everything feels like it's the worst that's ever been. Yeah. But hoping that, that <laughs> okay that's not the hope she's about part. to turn a corner the hope, she's turning the the hopeful bit is that we will figure it out on how to get it because we have to for our survival really because mm-hmm. we're not our brains are not equipped i mean if you think about in our lifetimes i mean my husband and i i'm not that old i'm in my early 40s we got our first smartphones together <laughs> you know, (laughs) in 2008. So that's like in just in my adulthood. And I got it because I was in graduate school and all these other people had them. And they were like, 
there would be a, some opportunity would come up during a class, like a lunch with someone really interesting and people would, it would all be filled up. And I was like, how did you even know that that had happened? <laughs> But anyways, that's actually hopeful to me. I I just believe that we're still in this a revolutionary moment and and if we can almost embrace that and have like a longer term view of what the whether it's the future we live in or or the future that our our Kids. our children, grandchildren or our friend or whoever whatever your life looks like if you you know that the future generations have it's like an investment in that and having a longer view it helps it f- feel less um chaotic and terrible mm-hmm. yeah. i don't know <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. i mean change is messy it, like growth is hard but you know without it what are we doing right i mean that's what i'm always like what are we doing here i don't know we got to do what something what are we doing here what are we doing here um but i wanted to ask you Steph, what are you feeling like culturally that you're seeing what's the vibe people what are people looking for in 2023 well okay i actually think this is like the one thing that i keep coming back to over and over again that gives me hope so i'm gonna share it because maybe yeah you can come back to it um but i'm like a you know abolish all of the systems type of person and i have always been that way and i'm very much the like black sheep of my family in that way like my family's like pretty conservative and you know whatever anyways i lived with my <laughs> brother in the pandemic is complicated <laughs> yeah um but i live with my brother and his wife in um the pandemic they were kind enough to let me and i didn't have anywhere to go it was like when they cut down the borders and then even still i was like so afraid to be on my own because I have incredibly complicated mental health issues that were getting like really inflamed at that point. Um, Mm -hmm. So I was living with my brother and we would have all these conversations because it was like when like, you know, protests were happening with like Black Lives Matter and, you know, the world is seeming very scary and chaotic and we didn't go outside much. So we spent all of this time in the house together and in his backyard um, having these really hard conversations and it wasn't that we hadn't had them before, but it was that he like wasn't listening mm. and he like self-identified that. And he like legitimately voted differently for the first mm. time Aww. and like has changed mm-hmm. the way he talks about certain things and the language that he uses and like the way he listens when like even his wife is talking. Mm. And to me, that is such a beautiful thing, because as much as I'm someone who's like, I have to go to all the protests and do all of the things and like, you know, invest in my communities in this way. I don't most days believe that there's impact that happens from that. I I believe that we have to do it so that those movements stay strong and like we feel like supported in them and whatever and raise awareness and bring more people into them. But it was such a clear example of like having a conversation with someone and like as you said earlier Rebecca like taking down that wall that sort of separates them from other issues mm-hmm. and and actually seeing that it it made a difference and i think about that literally all the time like i'm like yeah. if if that happened with one person think of the the change that can happen like i have goosebumps mm-hmm. right now because i'm yeah. like yes. i don't know in in love with that example no it's beautiful so that gives me hope and everyone else can take that little piece and bring it with them to, uh, for hope i love that yeah we have a we we made a show with um a great progressive organizer called george gale and it was called to see each other um we made it came out before the 2020 um election and he was basically like please don't give up on rural peoples in america Mm -hmm. like hey you know blue city folks like no and one of the the main tenets of his work as an organizer is about this it's about deep listening and there's a lot of academic studies that show that versus like knocking on a door and asking one question having like a 15 minute conversation where you deeply listen allows for change in people's perspective and ultimately politics and in 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 it's like it's like a 95 percent difference it's something outrageous Outrageous. like and so it's it's very real and very impactful and very hopeful to me thank you steph and thank you to your brother for listening and we're not mad that he didn't listen before because now he did listen (laughs) yeah and (laughs) i do think i mean just to go to technology for like a quick aside i do think 
you know, a lot of people, it's hard to have those like deep conversations because we just want to yell over each other. Mm-hmm. Like, Correct. I just want to be like, just abortions are good. You know, like that <laughs> end of fucking story, like stop talking. You know, I want to do yeah. that. And it's hard to not get to that place when you're like having like a long conversation with someone and trying to like understand their point of view and like bring in your own. But one thing that also happened in the pandemic that is kind of hopeful that is carrying through is that we're like interfacing virtually, which I know created a lot of distance for people. But I do also think it slowed us down in a way where like we can't physically talk over each other. Like if we Mm -hmm. start fighting in this Riverside recording, like (laughs) it's not going to work. I won't be able to hear you. You won't be able to hear me. I won't be able to hear myself. And like that is kind of a cool thing like it has forcefully made people you know sit and wait their turn to speak well i'm not in zooms or recordings usually with straight white men so i'll (laughs) i i I defer to someone else to let me know if they actually wait their turns (laughs) or are listening (laughs) wait robin i want to know what you're hopeful for in 2023 or what 2023 is the year of like how did you answer that well my answer was a personal answer you want to hear that yeah. I mean, it wasn't about anything dirty. I mean, I could tell that too, but it wasn't. I mean, yeah. I mean, sure. <laughs> um, no, mine was, I, I last year was about abundance. And I'm still like, I feel like I'm still living into that because I, I definitely grew up like as a poor kid. And as I mentioned, with not a lot of like great parenting. And so like I have a, the other shoe's always going to drop kind of mentality. And so I wanted to believe that, you know, money will be plentiful, opportunities will be plentiful. But I, what I came up with, it took me like 20 minutes to get to it, but I came up to... um. I want 2023 to be the year of inevitability. And what I meant by that Mm. was that, of course, it's coming to me. It's an extension Mm. of abundance, but but like I'm good enough, I'm worthy. And it's not just a question of like, I'm going to show up and I have a chance. It's like, no, things are going to come. They are coming. It's inevitable. And I'm living Mm -hmm. into it versus hoping. And like, I think I hope's that. a very powerful tool, but I also think declaring can be even more powerful. And so I'm declaring it's coming. It sounds like you have like a, you're like a confident abundant. Yeah. Like you're like, yeah. you've leveled up the abundance. Yeah. And Wait, is this the like, new Myers-Briggs? I mean, my yeah, you're a confident abundant. abundant. <laughs> I'm a C, I'm a CA. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to add it to my dating profiles quickly. Yeah, um, hold on. Yeah, it's on my, on my field. But I mean, my, my, my hope, if I'm taking it back to like what we're talking about, my hopefulness comes that we will listen and talk to one another more because I have this whole philosophy and I won't go to the whole thing, but that the loudest voices on the right and on the left are just the fringe and they're taking up too much space. And they're maybe, maybe they're 10% on either side, but the 90% of us who are huddled around the middle need to be talking to each other. Like, mm-hmm. I, you know, like I might be just this side of right and you might be just the side of left or vice versa. And we need to we need to hear each other and like and and not wait until you're done talking to make my point, but actually hear how these things impact you so I can hear where you come from and so you can hear what I know. And and I think when you get there, there's compromise can be had. And I think that's where the hope is. Like you've mentioned a couple of times the um this this hot mess that's happening with the House of Speaker as we're recording. And I have been glued to the TV for three days, but not in the way that I was, say, during the Trump era. That was just like a panic. Like this is more just like huh, I hope that what's going to come out of this is seeing some broken things and and more awareness from all of the rational people. And then let's work together. That's my mm-hmm. hope. Mm-hmm. I will say this, Rebecca and Amy, this has been, I mean, I, I feel like I'm speaking for Steph here, but we could talk to you guys for 14 more hours, but oh, for sure. I'm not sure anyone wants us to do that. So I'm so Fuck thankful em. that you- Oh my God. <laughs> Go my husband yourself. just the other day, he goes, I, I put on a podcast and I thought of you immediately. And I was like, okay, why? He goes, because it was a two hour and 45 minute conversation. <laughs> and he was like, and I know you would have just reached through that earphones to strangle them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a bit long. Um, but it was just, this was so wonderful. I feel more hopeful having chatted with you guys, but I did want to ask you all to tell our well-adjusted listeners 
or I didn't even say the name of my podcast right, the Well Adjusting Listeners, uh, where they can find all of your content. Oh my, this is how long I've been on break. Where can they find all your content and your social media and your handles and all that jazz? Because we all would need to be following you and involved in what you're doing. Well, you can listen to the Mashup Americans podcast, of which Grief Collected is our seventh season, I believe, of our show. Um, anywhere you listen to podcasts, so um. Grief Collected or the Mashup Americans. You can search for either of those. You can also find a beautiful website that we made for Grief Collected, which has tons of resources, white papers, um, a bookshelf that you can shop from. All the transcripts, all the tidbits from the show are on there. That's griefcollected.com. You can also uh, find us anywhere on social at Mashup American. We have our website also, mashupamericans.com. And we also have a weekly newsletter, which you can sign up for. Wait, also, this is now too many CTAs. But speaking of joyful, hopeful things, we made a rom-com, audio rom-com. Oh, we did. In 2022. <gasps> and it's called Love and Noreba. It is currently at, like the iHeartMedia um, Awards nominated for Podcast of the Year next to like Conan O'Brien and... Ooh. Whatever the show is with um, Sean Hayes and Smartless. Jason Bateman. Yep. Smartless. And um, it's called Love and Norebang. And just in terms of like joy, connection, fun, it has Randall Park as the narrator and he plays nice. Los Angeles. So just Love and Norebang. So that's a lot of things. Basically, griefcollected.com and then Love and Norebang. And between those, you can find all the other good stuff. So, oh my god, nice. amazing. And we'll link to all of that in the show notes. Yes. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us. This was such a wonderful chat. Thank you so much for thank having you. us. Little twins talking at the same time. <laughs> 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 Well Adjusting is an edit audio original, exec produced by Steph Colburn and Robin Hopkins. Thank you to Maria Passingham, Kathleen Speckert, and the whole edit audio team. 